Welcome. Thank you for joining me once again as we walk through the Gospel of Matthew. Today we have a, a particularly interesting story where Jesus tells his disciples to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And uh, kind of digging into that, that's a, it's actually a pretty deep message uh, that the disciples weren't uh, particularly familiar with, but it's something we all need to be aware of. Let's get into it. The yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Matthew 16. The Pharisees and the Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, when evening comes, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky. But you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for miraculous sign, but none will be given except the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left them and went away. When the disciples went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They discussed this among themselves and said, It's because we didn't bring any bread that he's saying that. Aware of their discussion, Jesus said, You of little faith, why are you talking among yourselves about not having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves and the five thousand and how many baskets full you gathered afterwards? Or the seven loaves and the four thousand and how many baskets full you gathered? How is it you don't understand? I was not talking about bread. But be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. A rather enigmatic section of scripture, and a lot of scholars have puzzled over what exactly this means, and you really need to get some context to begin to break it down. The Pharisees and Sadducees did not like each other. They were different religious groups. Uh, Pharisees believed in the whole Bible. The Sadducees focused on the law itself instead of the prophets. Uh, The Pharisees believed in resurrection, and the Sadducees said, when you're dead, you're dead. There's no life after death. They clashed often, but were both very influential groups. The two groups together represented two-thirds of the leadership of Palestine, the Sanhedrin. And uh, and so they were very influential people. The the disciples probably saw them as powerful and, and people that we should curry favor with, people that we should get on our side if we're going to, you know, have a revolution against the Romans. And, and they seemed to think that Jesus was somehow going to do that. He was the Messiah, but their their view of the Messiah was that he was a a worth worldly, earthly uh, redeemer, and that he would lead a revolution against the Romans. And they still didn't quite understand what he was actually all about. Now Jesus saw the Pharisees and Sadducees for what they were. They were legalists. They were teaching rules taught by men, and we discussed that a little previously. And uh, they're still trying to establish their authority, their control. And they saw Jesus as someone who who was out of control. And so they were trying to bring him in line and to get him to sort of butter up to them. And uh, so that they could use him for their political purposes. Uh, But Jesus was interested in the spiritual well-being of Israel, not the uh, physical, political situation there. And so he he saw what the Pharisees and Sadducees were trying to do, and he just wasn't going to have any of it. He told him, give us a sign. I find that very ironic. Jesus has been performing miracles, healings, casting out demons up and down the whole countryside on a daily basis for thousands of people. The stories were flooded. The reason the Pharisees and the Sadducees came to him was they were hearing these stories about this rabbi with miraculous powers teaching strange things. 
things that they did not back. That's why they came out there, because they had heard these stories. They had seen people that were blind that could see, who were lame that could walk. And so they walk up to Jesus and say, show us a sign from heaven. Give us a sign that you're who you really say you are, that you're, you're of God. Well, that's kind of crazy since he'd been doing these signs all over the place, all the time, in his ministry. The Pharisees said Jesus asked him to give him a sign to establish his credibility, as if he needed to sort of present his credentials to them. They were, they were letting him know, we're the ones who will determine if you are kosher or not, if you are credible or not, if you, if you have the authorization of the ruling party in Israel. And so they're trying to let Jesus know who's in charge here. And Jesus knows exactly who's in charge here, and it's not them. If Jesus were to give them a sign, he'd be acknowledging their authority over him. That's exactly what they were trying to do, was establish their authority over him. And Jesus, he was the Son of God. Uh, he just wasn't going to have Pharisees and Sadducees telling him what he could or couldn't do or what he could or couldn't teach since he's the one who actually helped write the Bible in the first place. So he just wasn't going to have it. Then he says, you'll get nothing but the sign of Jonah. It is interesting, if you're familiar with the story of Jonah, Jonah goes to Nineveh, a bunch of Gentiles, pagans, if you will, and he doesn't perform any miracles. God sends him there and tells him to preach the message of doom and gloom. He, he preaches that God's going to destroy their city due to their wickedness. That's all he does. He doesn't show any big signs of power or anything like Elijah and Elisha. And it's interesting because these pagans, these, these people that were depraved and evil, they didn't know God, they didn't like the Jews, but when they heard the word of the Lord, they repented. And God decided not to destroy the city at that time. That's a story that sort of sticks in the Israelites' history because it showed that pagans were more open to repenting before God than even God's own people who had the law. The depraved Ninevites responded to God, but here the religious elite, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, can't even recognize the Son of God. Those who know the scriptures should have been able to recognize who Jesus really was, is, and they didn't. And Jesus is making that point. So what is the sign of Jonah? Well, some scholars believe that it's simply the fact, the teaching of repentance and humility before God, and that that's what Jesus is referring to, that it was just Jonah's simple teaching of repentance that they should have responded to. However, most scholars agree that, that it's bigger than that, that it's the reference to Jonah being in the whale for three days and three nights. And it's a clear reference that the sign of Jonah, which Jesus is talking about, is his own death, burial, and resurrection. That just as Jonah came out of the whale after three days, so Jesus will come out of the earth after three days. That that will be the sign of Jonah to the scribes and the Pharisees, to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So what exactly is the yeast? What's Jesus referring to? He made a reference to yeast. The disciples thought he's referring to their lack of bread, obviously missing the whole point. Recently, Jesus had just fed two crowds of, over, of thousands with just a few loaves of bread and a few fish, and yet they're worried, oh no, we forgot the bread. And so Jesus, having explained to them, no, I'm not talking about bread. And he reminds them of, of the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000. And he uses that phrase they're probably getting a little tired of, you of little faith. They just still aren't grasping what he's trying to teach them. Now, this is part of the Sermon on the Mount. And I bring it in just to simply show how many times do you think his disciples heard this teaching? The Sermon on the Mount is a sort of a, a stereotypical sermon that Jesus probably preached all over Israel. And so his disciples would have heard it many, many times. And so in Matthew 6, one of those teachings is, Do not be anxious then, saying, What shall we eat or what shall we drink? 
with what shall we clothe ourselves? For all these things the Gentiles eagerly seek. For your father knows what you need. He knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you or added to you. That Jesus had taught them this many times, and yet they still didn't seem to be getting it. They heard it, but they hadn't really bought into it yet. And so he mentions the yeast of the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and their first thought is, oh, no, we forgot the bread. And Jesus just can't believe it. You can just tell he's frustrated. I just fed thousands with a few loaves. This, this is not about bread. It's not about God providing. God will provide for his people. So what exactly was Jesus talking about? The yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It says, then they understood. He was not telling them to guard against yeast, yeast, and bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Well, what was it that they were teaching? They actually had two different kinds of theology. They weren't even teaching the same things. So what was... Their teaching, what did their teaching have in common that Jesus was, was telling his disciples to beware, to guard against the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Well, they were both teaching a works righteousness, the, the idea that you could earn your salvation, that if you did enough good things and if you had more good things than bad things and they put it on the scale, then, you know, God will let you into heaven, that somehow he'll owe you or be obligated to let you into heaven if you do enough good things. And so they had, they had reduced a relationship with God into a bunch of rules and regulations and boxes to check. And that's not who God is or what he's all about. So they were teaching a, a earn your way to heaven kind of an approach, even though the Sadducees didn't even believe in a heaven and a life after death. But they were teaching our works righteousness. They were, they were really teaching paganism. And paganism is basically the idea that if you say the right things and do the right sacrifices and, and you know, stand on one foot and raise your right hand and make two spins, they had all these things that if you did these things, the gods would be obligated to do something for you. That this idea, or, or obligated to stay away from you. Some, some religions, the, the gods were very malevolent, and so they would offer all these incantations and sacrifices to get the gods to ignore them. And that's not who God is at all. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is a God who cares about his people. And so they, the Sadducees and the Pharisees somehow had, had, had gotten mixed up in their religions and started teaching this idea that, it, you know, if you jump through all these hoops and check these boxes, then God owes you something. And the fact is God doesn't owe us anything. We sinned against him. We separated ourselves from him. And so this idea that we could somehow obligate God to save us, obligate God to bless us, uh, that, that, that's what pagans teach. That's not what the Bible tells us about a relationship with God. They were teaching the rules and regulations of men rather than a relationship with God as our loving Heavenly Father. And God is all about relationship, not about rules and regulations. And we want the grace of God. So what's the call to action? You kind of dig a little deeper in this one. He's telling the disciples, we've got to, we're called to live by faith in God. We're called to trust God, not approach him like if we do X, Y, and Z, he'll do something for us. But, but living it by faith is, is trusting in a relationship with God, that he is a loving heavenly father, that he actually wants to bless us. He wants to do good things for us if we will obey him, if we will trust him, have faith in him. And so Jesus is trying to explain, look, you guys are worried about bread. Trust God. Don't be worried about that kind of stuff. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. God will take care of these things. He knows you need them, and he's a loving Heavenly Father who will provide them. We're called to have a relationship with God, a daily interaction, like we would have with our own fathers here on earth when we live with them, that, that you would engage on a regular basis in a loving relationship. You would trust and obey out of respect, 
Uh, talks about fearing the Lord, but that's not talking about a terrified, you know, shaking fear. It's talking about just having a, a healthy respect for the creator of the universe. That he is in charge. He has all authority. And he sent his son to die for us. That should tell us what a loving father we do have. And so we need to engage in a relationship. That's, that's a daily interaction. That's not just a checking in on Sundays or, or maybe even just checking in a couple Sundays a year. This is about having a walk with God on a daily basis. But the main focus here is to beware of the legalism and the paganism that can easily slip into our relationships with God our, our, and destroy it. Basically, Jesus is telling the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you, you've missed the whole point. You claim to be the religious leaders of Israel, and yet you don't seem to have a relationship with God. You seem to have a relationship with the law, with the rules, with the teachings of the elders. And, and Jesus is letting them know it's real easy to slip into that. You know, following a set of rules and check boxes to check, it's easier than having a relationship. And we understand that in so many other ways, but, you know, the idea that a husband and wife would, would say they have a good relationship because they can check a bunch of boxes off, anyone knows that's not really a relationship. You, know, you say, do you, you know, are you a good husband? Well, I, you know, I, I provide, I pay the bills, I put food on the table, I do all this, I help with the kids, and, you know, every now and then help with the laundry. That makes me a good husband. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean you have a good relationship. And vice versa, if the wife approaches it like, well, hey, I do the laundry and take care of the kids. And, you know, if, if she just has a bunch of checklists, that's not really a good relationship. Relationship is about interacting. It's about enjoying the fellowship, working towards a common goal. And, and we're, we're called to beware of the legalism that can so easily slip into a healthy relationship. And that can happen. We, we've seen marriages like that. who They literally think that's a good marriage if I just check all the boxes. And uh, it doesn't really work that way. And it doesn't work that way with God either. That legalism and paganism can slip in when we're not looking. And, and we can start having, um, even in our own fellowship, I've, I've seen people that talk about, well, we're saved by the grace of God. Everyone understands that. No one will deny it. The Bible says that we're saved by the grace of God. But in order to get saved by the grace of God, you've got to meticulously follow a whole bunch of rules to get it. That actually doesn't make any sense. I've heard people say, you know, if you didn't understand everything about baptism when you were baptized, then you might not really be saved. And i got to be honest with you, I was baptized when I was 11. I made a commitment to God. Since then, I've learned a whole lot about baptism that I never know, and I'm still discovering things about baptism. So this idea that you have to understand everything for it to be a valid baptism... That's not about the grace of God. That's about legalism. That's about paganism. The, the, the idea that I have to, you know, do it just right. I've, I've seen people squabble on the mission field and even here in America where someone's baptized, but, you know, their arm was out of the water or their, their head didn't quite get wet or, or something along. The, and, and, you know, maybe it wasn't a valid baptism. Boy, that just that smacks of legalism. That smacks of making rules where the Bible doesn't say anything like that. It says immerse them. Get them immersed. If their fingernail or their hand or maybe the top of their ponytail stuck out, I don't think that's really what God's concerned with. He's concerned about making a commitment to God. And yes, if you can immerse them whole, everyone will feel better. I'm all for it. But to get hung up on, on making rules where the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible never says, unless the person's completely immersed all at the same time, they're not saved. We need, to, we need to approach God like a loving Heavenly Father, not like some sort of judge who's going to see if we've stepped outside of the line just a little or colored outside of the line, and somehow that nullifies everything that we've worked for in our relationship with God. Got to be careful.
And that's why I think Jesus sort of leaves it a little, a little bit of an enigma, a little, a little vague. He's, he's saying, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees because it can creep in in all sorts of different ways. I've, I've just used one example. But there's so many ways we can start slipping into a works righteousness, uh, slip into a, a checklist of our relationship with God, and uh, start having this idea that God owes me something. And instead of actually responding to God out of gratitude for what a great heavenly father that he is. And so let me, let me leave you with that lesson. And, and, and I pray God's blessing that you will have the wisdom and the insight to see where legalism can start slipping into our faith. And we are saved by the grace of God, by the blood of Jesus Christ, through our faith in him, through our relationship in him, and not by our works. And let's beware of that. Be careful of that in our own lives as well as in those around us that we are trying to encourage to draw closer and closer to God. May God bless you. Thank you for joining me.